everyone who matters is here. Good morning. Um, so, ah, the mic, right. Good morning. Uh, my name is Ishai Blank, and I'm from here. Um, and again, thanks um, to all for coming and for um, joining us uh, on the second day. Um, we begin uh, our panel um, with a presentation of uh, Ravit Reichman from University of Brown, or Brown University. Um, and her commentator is Irene Tucker from UC Irvine. Please. Thank you. Thank you, Ishai. Uh, thank you uh, to the organizers, really, for uh, what's been a wonderful conference so far. It's going to be, I think, continue to be wonderful, and, and also just to everybody for, you know, for fabulous discussion so far. It's really good to be here. Um, so I'm, I'm actually going to start in a place that I didn't start in or didn't go to in, uh, in the paper that you have. And some of what I'll say today is going to recap some of what's in the paper to kind of, you know, for, for those who haven't read it or haven't read it recently, um, but also just try to open up some other avenues. So, um, so I'm starting with with, uh, with Forster, who in some ways um, is, feels to me like he kind of hangs out in the paper in various places but doesn't really emerge. Um, so in 1910, Ian e. Forster attempted to imagine in novel form what inheritance might look like when its course runs far afield from being kept in the family. His experiment took the form of the novel Howard's End, and its central act of familial treason took the form of one sentence written in pencil by Ruth Wilcox, who's just died, to her husband Henry. I should like Miss Schlegel, Margaret, to have Howard's End. That is all. No explanation, no apology or excuse within which to situate her wish that her family's beloved estate be inherited not by a family member, but by a mere acquaintance, a woman she hardly knew, and a foreigner at that, since Margaret Schlegel, as her name suggests, is of German lineage. The family refuses to carry out this wish, refuses, in other words, to honor Mrs. Wilcox's deathbed will. But in hushed and outraged negotiations that follow, Forster presents us with the novel's central concept, his own meditation on what the spirit demands, whether or not the law will accommodate it. So this is the, the passage you have here. I, I'll, there's a little more to it that I didn't put on the, on the slide, but I'll, I'll read the whole thing. To them, Howard's end was a house. They could not know that to her it had been a spirit for which she saw a spiritual heir. And pushing one step further in these mists, may they not have decided even better than they supposed? Is it credible that the possessions of the spirit can be bequeathed at all? Has the sole offspring, a witch elm tree, a vine, a wisp of hay with dew on it, can passion for such things be transmitted where there is no bond of blood? No, the Wilcoxes are not to be blamed. The problem is too terrific, and they could not even perceive a problem. No, it is natural and fitting that after due debate, they should tear the note up and throw it onto their dining room fire. And then the passage continues, the practical moralist may acquit them absolutely. He who strives to look deeper may acquit them, almost. For one hard fact remains, they did neglect a personal appeal. The woman who had died did say to them, do this. And they answered, we will not. Um, so I'm drawn to this passage for so many reasons. First of all, of course, because it opens up the kind of key concept of the novel, this concept of the spiritual heir that, that Forster as a good liberal cares about. Um, but uh, also because all these negations, no, we will not, the, um, the, kind, of, um, the, the kind of negative structure of, of this passage. Um, but of course, Forster is really calling our attention to something that intuitively we all sense, um, that property in its legal iteration only accounts for a fraction of its social, psychological, and emotional heft. And while the law may safeguard this more mystical dimension and kind of leave it to us to sort that out in other places, it's also not entirely hospitable to it. Um, and it may be one reason we turn to property time and again to cope with a traumatic past or to stage more intimate and less historical struggles. Um, it may be that one reason that we do this has to do with this notion of the spiritual heir, the investment in inheritance as a category and concept rather than as, tra as a transaction, which is why we talk about inheriting lots of things that aren't actually, strictly speaking, property, why it's a sort of useful term and concept for us. Um, the problem I submit is that we often find ourselves unable to articulate what precisely the desire for inheritance and more pointedly restitution is about. Why, in other words, is property figured so centrally in our sense of justice? The answers to this question often strike me as either too obvious, too tautological, or simply too unsatisfying. More straightforwardly, the return of property may well be the closest we can possibly come to a reversal of history. So there's the kind of obvious point. Um, I mean, it's not um, 
beside the point, but uh, it, 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 it's, I find it unsatisfying, right? But, but certainly there's a compelling neatness, a symmetry in property restitution, as well as the promise of cultural renewal at the prospect of museums restored or revitalized with works of art, of institutions founded, or individual life supported through financial compensation. Um, and it's also clear to me why discussions of property and justice gravitate toward homes and frozen bank accounts or, uh, or, or you know, works of art. Um, their, their worth is indisputable, right? Um, but the property that I'm thinking about doesn't fall into these categories. It's of the more ordinary, less valuable variety. It's the kind of thing we have to deal with rather than the kind of thing that we seek out or, or the kind of thing that we litigate for. Um, uh, so, so I propose two other answers to the question of why property has come to feature so critically in our sense of justice. Um, first, uh, there's simply too much of it, um, more than can ever be enumerated or litigated, um, so that there's a kind of analysis interminable about it um, that appeals to our sense of, of justice never being done over certain things, of, of something that, that, that we don't want to necessarily put to rest. Um, uh, this excess demands a conceptualization of ownership outside the bounds of reparations, new ways of confronting the violence that grows ever more distant with the passage of time. Um, so in this sense, property functions as a testament to our juridical restlessness, a means by which to resist the dominance of law and post-war justice. Second, I argue that this excess also means that we're not entirely of, uh, in possession of our desire for inheritance that there's something about the potentiality of inheritance, the sense of not knowing what, a, what it would open up, that is itself crucial to why we make the material claims that we do. What this means is that our turn to property is less about common sense, or can be less about common sense, about restoring some kind of equilibrium or keeping cultural or familial continuity intact, and more about an irrational or not fully articulable need or want. Um, so if these issues are somewhat uh, at play in, uh, in Howard Zen, they come into contemporary focus in uh, the film that I, um, that I look at in my paper, uh, Arnold Goldfinger's um, The Flat, uh, which invites us to imagine what a spiritual heir might mean in our times. Um, what it dramatizes and what it documents, um, and, and I do care about the fact that it happens to be a documentary, um, not something that I generally look at, in, in fact, in my work. Um, I tend to look at fiction. Uh, so. so um, what it dramatizes is the desire of an uncertain nature that's attached to inheritance, the unfolding of, pro of a property story that isn't about law, strictly speaking, but that can't quite shed the law either. Um, so just by way of a very brief summary, um, the flat begins with Goldfinger filming his, uh, his family as they dismantle his grandmother's Tel Aviv apartment after her death. Um, as he describes it, he, he thought he was recording the end of a way of life, the generation of, of Yekas, the German Jews. Uh, who had transplanted their culture in Israel um, and whose ways and means um, were shrines or testaments or labors of love to the Berlin of their youth. Um, but in sorting through Gerda Tuchler's possessions, the family finds evidence that, uh, that she and her husband, uh, Kurt Tuchler, uh, had had a long-standing friendship with a high-ranking Nazi official and his wife, uh, the von Mildensteins. Um, the story of an inheritance then becomes a much more somber affair. Um, a kind of quest narrative of sorts um, that, that sends him to Germany to, to, to research, to look into this past, um, and uh, to consult all these experts, both in Israel and in Germany. Um, and, uh, and finally, uh, on a number of occasions, to go to visit the granddaughter of, uh, or sorry, the daughter, he's the grandson, but she's the, the daughter of these people, the von Mildensteins, um, to attempt in the tones and gestures of friendship to understand this deleted chapter of his family's past. Um, at its very outset, the flat is awash in property's profanity, in its excess, the too much property that one experiences as an obligation and that one addresses in the spirit of both duty and love. Uh, nothing dramatizes this quite like the garbage bags that are so prevalent in the film's early scenes um, that, that are filled over and over again and heaved over the balcony um, of the apartment. But, um, but the film then complicates these images of excess or detritus um, with gestures of civility, of politeness, um, uh, of these flowers that uh, he brings to, to, you know, over and over again to all the people that, that he meets, so that its action is kind of poised or balanced between what's cast off and what's sought out, uh, what's discarded and what's cultivated. Um, but what the film also dramatizes in the relay between these, these places is the relationship between inheritance and time, and specifically the experience of time without continuity. 
um, even though that's precisely what Goldfinger seems to be after in trying to document and sort of fill in the gaps of his grandparents' story. Um, this is the kind of temporal rupture that Hannah Arendt has in mind when she writes about the possibility of a moment of truth in history. I'm not going to go over too much of Arendt, but, um, but I will just uh, read one moment from, from uh, what's in the paper. Um, time is not a continuum, um, she writes in her reading of Kafka, a flow of uninterrupted succession. It is broken in the middle. Only because man is inserted into time and only to the extent that he stands his ground does the flow of indifferent time break, in, break up into tenses. The film's resistance to this indifferent time, which I take to be the kind of time in which an inheritance of flat and its contents is sorted through and passed on rather seamlessly to the next generation, um, this resistance takes place in a context that's neither wholly legal nor entirely familial, a context that we might simply call the social world. Um, but this context, it turns out, is rendered in its own right foreign, awkward, a kind of minefield of sorts. Um, let me see if I can... It's a hearing, yes, exactly. Why isn't it? Oh. Oh, this must be. No, I don't have it separately. I don't know. I'm, I'm like, no. well, you see, they're on a train. <laughs> the documents and the yeah, the, the it's the dialogue in the papers. Do you see it on your Okay. All right, but you, anyway, that's the, yeah, see, oh, that's too bad, that was the, yeah, in any case, um, uh, there's a lot that we can say about this moment, and, and the, fortunately the dialogue is actually in the paper, so it, we can always come back to that. Um, but for now, let's just point out the studious avoidance, uh, at least the belief that one has to studiously avoid anything that smacks of law, right? We don't want to come across like we know something and are there to interrogate them, um, Goldfinger says to his mother. Um, but there's also that lingering connection to Forster, right? Only things about our family concern us. Hannah Goldfinger declares as though answering the narrator of Howard's End in the negative, right? This question that the narrator raises, can passion for such things, a witch elm tree, a vine, a wisp of hay with dew on it, be transmitted when there's no bond of blood? Um, neither such passion nor, we're meant to, nor we are meant to understand such loss can be passed outside the family. Not that it isn't possible on some affective level. It just isn't proper or polite or fair. Um, the social world, with its strained collision of property and friendship, is where we discover just how hard it is to confront the past in person and without the substance of material claims. Um, the flat is constructed out of one such claim after another. So here's the sort of final scene where he, Goldfinger, finds a CV with, uh, uh, you know, the uh, you know evidence of his, uh, you know, of, of von Mildenstein's uh, high-ranking SS activity, and uh, and brings it to, to to Edda, and she says to him. You know, I don't really know. You know this doesn't say anything. I did this, you know, I'd like to learn around it. But you know, he really presses her, and she finally says, she kind of sighs, and then she says, anything else? Um, so this is where all of these kind of various material claims end up, right? In this kind of suspended or severed, uh, frankly, as I see it, uh, attempt at friendship. Um, but that's also why I read the film as a folktale of frustration and embarrassment, with interactions so halting, so laced with unspoken appeals or demands that we end up feeling strangely at home um, <coughs> in this footage from the Eichmann trial which features the prosecutor Gideon Hausner's um, cross-examination of the accused, right? And he asks, during emigration, the Jews were forced to relinquish their property, correct? Das ist richtig, aber nicht meine Schuld, Eichmann replies, and the interpreter translates, that's correct, but not my fault. Um, for practical reasons, this makes sense because he goes on to name von Mildenstein as, as a serious player in, uh, in this business. Um, but I think this moment also anchors the film in a critical way, um, effectively and intuitively rather than factually. 
Um, so much of what will happen is compressed into this exchange with its interlocking themes of property violence and the disavowal of responsibility in the face of irrefutable fact. Um, so that correct but not my fault may well be the refrain of a film that explores how individuals both in Israel and Germany have come to manage their reality even as they deny the truth about their past. Um, because unlike the terrain that the film traverses, the ground of the trial is familiar. Um, its method and structures are dictated Okay, I'll stop on one more page. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, its method and structures are dictated by accepted juridical practice, and above all, we both know that uh, how it ends and that it ends. Um, I, I want to actually, uh, you know, it, 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 it's just, it just, it seems that we've kind of arrived at this place where um, the public stories crowd out the stories that can be told in private, um, obstructing an any effort to have a real conversation about the warriors when the personal stakes are high. Um, I actually want to end on Arendt in a different vein. Um, so um, Hannah Arendt made the case uh, that moments of truth arise in the gap between past and future, which um, was, was what I um, mentioned earlier. But she also claimed elsewhere that the world lies between people. Um, she made the statement in 1959 to a German audience in Hamburg who had just awarded her the Lessing Prize. Accepting the award, she goes on in pointed fashion to make the case against those who had dealt with Hitler's Germany by inner emigration, who had retreated into the confines of their private worlds and continued to write pastoral <laughs> poetry or philosophical enquiries, who believed that they were and believed that they were thereby inoculating themselves from the pestilence that had become their country. Um, and that word pestilence, I think, is how they saw it, not how I see it. Um, these very inner emigrants presumably constituted much of her audience, and she insists as a, uh, in address, on addressing them not as a human being but forcefully and unapologetically as a Jew. She wasn't interested in overtures to their common humanity or in, argu in the argument that in speaking as a Jew to Germans, she was only recapitulating Hitler's terms. What she wants is to reclaim those terms or rather to claim them for friendship, which she sees as containing vast political potential. So there's the passage, thus in the case of friendship between a German and a Jew under the conditions of the Third Reich, it would scarcely have been a sign of humanness for the friends to have said, are we not both human beings? It would have been mere evasion of reality and of the world common to both at that time. They would not have been resisting the world as it was. A law that prohibited the intercourse of Jews and Germans could be evaded, but could not be defied by people who denied the reality of the distinction. In keeping with the humanist uh, that, has not, uh, that had not lost the solid ground of reality, a humanist in the midst of the reality of persecution, they would have had to say to each other, a German and a Jew, and friends. The work of the flat, the task it sets out for itself, comes very close to this acknowledgement, or rather seeks it out in the context of inheritance, of finding a spiritual heir within, with whom to make sense of what Goldfinger and his family have been left with. What would seem clear enough, right, for Arendt anyway, a matter of speaking plainly, of laying claim, by speaking plainly, appears over 50 years after Arendt accepted her prize and staked her claim strangely out of reach and painfully unutterable. <laughs>